The thing about nuclear reactions is they won't keep going forever. I need a neutron to collide with uranium, don't I? And yeah, I make new neutrons, but those neutrons have to find their way to more uraniums. And it turns out that to generate what's called a chain reaction, right? A chain reaction just means self-sustaining fission. All of these neutrons get cycled back in and they find new uraniums before they get absorbed by something else. Right? That's all that a chain reaction is. The old, the new neutrons go back and they start new reactions, but they have to find that uranium before they get too far away. We need what's called critical mass. We need a certain amount of fissionable material. Fissionable material is the thing that's getting bombarded with the neutrons to sustain that chain reaction. Right? I send a neutron in, those three neutrons come out, but they have to contact new uraniums to keep going. And same thing here, if I put out new neutrons, they all have to contact new uraniums, right? I see one neutron makes three new ones. That fits with the reaction here. Now what about this one? This reaction makes three new neutrons. This reaction makes one, two, three new neutrons. Not every one of them hit, right? What you need is what's called critical mass. You need to have enough uraniums close enough that your, urani that your uh, neutrons are direct hits. For uranium-235, that turns out to be about 33 pounds of uranium-235. That needs to be in pretty close contact to get a sustainable chain reaction. Uh, actually, about uh, 70 years ago, late 30s, early 40s, when they were working on the Manhattan Project, uh, the University of Chicago was where a lot of these nuclear physicists were and where they were doing their studies. And they kept their uranium in... Uh, basically concrete bunkers in lab space beneath the uh, University of Chicago football stadium and they were much closer than they would have liked when they uh, noticed uh, a few years later when they did the calculations to uh, getting a sustained chain reaction and chain reactions are what actually uh, produce nuclear weapons so uh, it would not have been a good situation for Chicago or for the Manhattan Project if that had happened in the middle of World War II. And just to give you an idea 33 pounds of uranium in one place is a sustainable chain reaction if I have just a kilogram, so this is about 22 pounds of uranium-235, I'll get 9 times 10 to the 13 joules of energy out of it. If we compare these exponents and we compare our front numbers here, that's almost a million times more energy released by just 2, sorry, 2.2 pounds of uranium. So critical mass is something that sustains a nuclear reaction, but probably we don't want in our power plants, and so we have to think about that. And power plants are designed to get just enough neutrons to keep the reaction going, but not to reach critical mass. So we contain, we build very strategically controlled nuclear reactions. There are two parts that we have to think about first, right? We need a fuel, that's uranium oxide, right? The uranium oxide contains the 235 uranium that we need to make this work. Also in there are what are called control rods. Control rods are responsible for taking away the excess neutrons, right? Every fission process spits out three neutrons. I probably don't want all three to go contact new uraniums because I get closer to critical mass. And so control rods take care of that problem. And control rods can actually be moved up and down. Control rods, when the fuel is new and very nice and live, are all the way down into the nuclear reactor because we need to take out a lot of neutrons. As the fuel gets older and there's less and less uranium in it, the control rods get lifted it out just a little bit higher because those neutrons, we need to have more neutrons available. So the control rods and the fuel rods are part of the reactor itself. And what happens in the reactor from there is that you have a reactor vessel filled with what's called primary coolant. And that primary coolant loop here is right inside. It actually contacts in a container around the control rods. The primary coolant is probably not water. It actually gets a heck of a lot warmer than the boiling point of water, and that's on purpose. What the primary coolant does is it absorbs the heat released by the fission process. And it can absorb a few more neutrons too, so it helps control that whole fission process. And then what it does there is it moves through a loop where it contacts the secondary coolant. The secondary coolant is actually the water. And you see how the water is in its own isolated loop here? It gets contacted 
by that very hot primary coolant, which warms it up even through the walls of the containers, right? The primary and the secondary coolant are never in direct contact, but the heat is more than enough to warm it up. And you get water and you turn water into steam, steam turns the turbine, turbine runs the generator, generator gives you power. You also uh, take advantage of the fact that I can recondense steam, right? You can always turn steam back into water. You contact it with yet another water loop, and this is probably a water loop from a lake. For example, there's some nuclear plants in Chicago that uh, this particular loop of water that's used to uh, condense the steam is uh, coming straight from Lake Michigan. But you'll notice that the primary loop is closed, right? This primary reactor loop is a completely closed circuit. The secondary loop is another completely closed and isolated circuit. Nothing that contacts nuclear material is ever in contact with the outside. Take a little bit more uh, of a closer look at the line between nuclear power and nuclear weapons. Remember, nuclear power plants are all about having just enough fission but not too much. And the bottom line is that for uh, nuclear power it comes down to uh, the fact that uranium-235 is a fissionable material, but uranium-238 is not. And so there's a couple of different things when I dig uranium out of the ground. It's not that I'm digging pure fissionable material. It's got some other stuff in it. And so we have to enrich that uranium. There are processes to do that by uh, and Basically, enriching uranium means that I separate out my isotopes, and I end up with something that is more enriched. It has more to uranium-235 than what I dig out of the ground. What I dig out of the ground is 0.7%-235. What you need is 3 to 5% to be a good fuel rod, but you need 90-plus percent to be a weapon. And the problem is that the enrichment process is the same regardless of what you're intending for it. And so this is where you get into a lot of uh, situations with, for example, Iran or North Korea. You have the country itself saying, we're enriching uranium so we can make fuel rods. And you have other countries saying, those are way too enriched to be fuel rods. Uh, we're not exactly uh, believing you here. right? This is, the same, this is the sort of political problems that we come into. But the bottom line is it comes down to getting a whole lot of fissionable material in one place. And enrichment allows you to do that. Too much in one place and you get a weapon.